this is not right. Okay, I think I'm back. I don't know what the heck's going on. We started the thing and then we lost the internet. So why why not? Why not lose the internet on the the day I'm doing something here? That that works. Uh let me get in here and share that screen again so we're looking at the same thing. I see some folks on here that I know, and I will warn you guys right up in advance, this is a beginning class. It's a kind of a, uh, you know, intro level class here to strobe. And um, so I don't want anybody to be bored. Um, that's fine. I mean, I, I see some names up here probably could teach this class. But anyway, I, I was noticing on the, uh, oh, by, by the way, my name is Don Gennetti lighting-essentials.com. Uh, I, I love teaching about photography. I've been doing it for nearly 40 years, or over 40 years. I can't do maths good. Um, but yeah, there's a, a, um, a lot of, of uh, bad information out there about flash photography. And I, I find that to be uh, kind of sad. It's, it's not hard. Flash photography is not hard, but I think a lot of people make it to be hard maybe because maybe they can sell more classes. I don't know. It's not hard. Um, but I, I want to go over a few basic things before we get into that. My feeling about light is, number one, light does the same thing every time. And that's an important concept to understand. If you turn on your little flash and you have it on half power, it will give you the same amount of light every time. It has to. It would, otherwise, it would be like playing a piano and going up and hitting a key and getting a different tone each time. Hit the key, get C. Hit the key, get C. Hit the key, get C. Um, that's the only way we can do this stuff. The only way we can do it is to have everything be the same. Uh, I have a link over on the Black Friday page, which is here, to some resources, one of which is this course right here on subject centric lighting. I hope that you take some time to look at it, but basically it's this, everything reflects from chrome to blue, dark blue flannel, except dark blue flannel doesn't reflect nearly as much as chrome. And everything in the middle, we have a, a way of looking at the world thinking that we put light on stuff. No, we provide light for that stuff to reflect. All we ever see when we see any subject in person through a lens, makes no difference, all we see is the light reflecting from them. We don't see the light going to them. And so too many photographers think about lighting as the light to the subject. I think about light as how does the subject reflect what I did. Okay, so let's get started with a, a couple of basics. I know a lot of uh, folks talk about the reciprocals and how reciprocals work and, and, and probably in flash photography it's really the, um, the basis for understanding how to use flash is to understand how to use reciprocals so let's pop over to reciprocals right here. It's very easy. I've made a little chart here. Uh, it's very, very easy to understand reciprocals. And here's our, here's our little chart right here. You'll see that, now this, this isn't the chart. I'm so sorry. First of all, we're gonna understand the Sunny 16 rule, okay? And this is really simple. This was designed way back when they first made film so that film would have some sort of basis for everybody to figure out. The sunny 16 rule means that the sun, when it's full sun overhead, the sun will give you F16 at the shutter speed equal to your ISO. So if you're shooting ISO 100 film, it's F16 at one one hundredth of a second. If you're shooting 400 speed 
ISO, it would be F16 at one four hundredth of a second. And if you know that simple, basic, single computation using reciprocals, you can figure out everything else. So if it's if it's uh, F16 at one one hundredth, it's F11 at two hundredth, because the hole got bigger. The hole got bigger. 16, the hole got bigger. In fact, it's twice as big. The hole got bigger, so we have to cut the, the, the exposure shorter. Understanding these reciprocals and how they work is absolutely fundamental to understanding lighting. So you have to learn some reciprocals. One is all you need. One point is all you need. And that's what we do here with the making a meter and learning how to use the flash. We have three variables in photography, the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. In days gone past, we're not gonna talk about the brand new thing called floating ISO, which I think is pretty cool, by the way. I think it's a pretty awesome thing. We're not gonna talk about that. But days in the past, we had film, and the entire roll of film would be rated at an ISO. The ISO might be 100 or 64, but we would make all our computations on that one ISO because the whole roll of film had to be developed as a unit. You couldn't change the ISO on the roll of film in the middle of the roll. With digital, we can change every shot. We can change the ISO. So the ISO becomes another floating or another moving variable. So if we make the ISO higher, the number higher, that means it's more sensitive and it takes less light. It's quite complex if you don't know your reciprocals, but once you know the reciprocals, it makes all the sense in the world. The amount of light to create an image on a sensor or a piece of film is X, X. The shutter speed determines how long the light goes in and the aperture determines how much light goes in. So if it's a little bit of light, it might take a longer time. If it's a short amount of time, it might take a, a wider aperture or a bigger hole. These holes, by the way, also represent depth of field changes, okay? We're not gonna really even talk about depth of field on here but they, they, they can alter depth of field changes. Um, I wonder if anybody, uh, I wonder if every, anybody really thinks about the sweet spot in photography. We're gonna talk just a little bit about that. The sweet spot in photography, in my opinion, is 250, 125, 116, 1 130th. On planet Earth, if you can freeze something at one two fiftieth, it's frozen at five hundred and a thousand. Stands to reason, the shutter speeds get getting smaller and smaller, or shorter and shorter. If something's blurry at a thirtieth of a second, like this guy running, if he's blurry at a thirtieth, he's going to be blurry at a fifteenth and eight and a quarter and a half. The sweet spot's right here between one two fifty and one twenty five. An ice skater at 125 is blurry. At 1250, you can freeze her. A bicycle, you can pan a bicycle at a 60th of a second. You might not be able to pan it at a 30th. You're definitely not gonna pan it at a 15th. So you have right in here where things move in these, these time frames. This is where we live. In days gone by, you had an F4, 200 millimeter lens, you were shooting a wedding and the light wasn't real bright, you know, you had limited light, you had uh, possibly F4 on your lens or 5.6, if it would go way back, you had a 5.6 200. So at ISO 100, you got a 60th of a second here, or at whatever ISO you're shooting, you got a 60th of a second. That might not freeze the bride, but 125th will. That's an F4. A 1250 will definitely, and that's an F28. And these, by the way, should not be commas. They should be points. Um, so when you changed from an F4 to an F28 lens, 
you went from a possibly blurry image to a sharp image. Today, we have floating ISO. We have ISO all over the place. Remember, you couldn't change the film before. Now we can just change the ISO. And I always have people stop and think, do you really need the 2.8 lens? Do you really need it? And I'm fine. People, some people really need it. Do you really need the 2.8 lens if you can float the ISO up to 200 or 400 and get the shutter speed you want? The answer I find is generally no. People who need the 2.8 are a small part of, of the photographic community. When they start going on about the depth of field, <laughs> oh, sorry, a headshot, you couldn't tell the difference. It's going to be just as blurry at four as, as it is a 2.8. I think the difference on a headshot is about like this much, 2.8. If this much is worth $1,300, then God, God bless. You, you need it. I understand. If I was shooting sports, I'd have 2.8 because I, I need to see everything on the field. If I was shooting weddings, I might go for 2.8 because, again, low light, I might need a little more uh, help on that end. But it's not a given these days. It was a given back then. A faster lens would, would save you in shutter speed. And that's the only reason, folks, was shutter speed. Not depth of field, shutter speed. One more in the sweet spot could save your, could save your image. So understanding that the size of the hole, fast shutter, as the hole gets smaller, the shutter cuts in half because even though it doesn't really look like it on this particular graphic here, the amount of space in here, the, the aperture, the hole, this hole is half as big as this hole. Half as big. This hole is half as big as this one. They're, they're round. The, the amount of square millimeters or pixels or whatever you want to go in these apertures here are half. Our shutter speeds go down by half as much or conversely twice as much when we're going from the, the, the small apertures up. Everything is either cut in half or double depending on which way you approach it. Half as, half as, as big as two, half as small as four. Or I mean, uh, twice the size of, well, the apertures are controlling apparatus. The shutter speeds are controlled then because if we make a change up here, we have to make a change down here. If we make the hole smaller, we have to let more light in. And again, 1 250th is twice as much time as 1 500th. Those are the only numbers we have to deal with, cutting it in half and doubling it, cutting in half and doubling it. Real simple maths, real simple maths. Do you know you already know the Sunny 16 rule? And if you start with the Sunny 16 rule in your head uh, and you're outside, you're going to all, you're going to be so far ahead of the game. It's amazing. Um, you have a uh, full sun at 16, uh, 11 with a, a little bit of clouds. That's those high clouds. It's still bright. Uh, eight is uh, cloudy or also backlight. Five, six is from the side. And F4 is in the shade, just one foot in the shade line. So you have all of these things. And by the way, it looks goofy. It looks really goofy. But if you put your hand out like this and you put your thumb up so your thumb meets your eye here, if the sun is hidden by your hand, you're no longer in sunny 16. If it's above your hand, sunny 16 is going to work for you. If it gets where your hand is blocking it because it's either going down or coming up, then all bets are off. It's going to depend on if it's a very, uh, you know, there's a lot of crap in the air. It can be a very warm sunset. That's going to lower your exposure. It can be a very clear, bright morning that might raise it from something. But once it clears your hand at that point, once it clears your hand, you're going to probably be sunny 16. Or so close to sunny 16, you know, Two points may not, may not matter. Um, okay, so that's a quick understanding of that part of it. If you go to the website and you're interested in um, knowing more, I have a Udemy course in lighting here. 
It's also free and no charge. I'm not trying to sell anything today. We have this Udemy course and it'll give you a lot more uh, practical stuff. It's an old course. The video camera was, I don't know, it was an iPhone 3 or something. I don't know. It's a video is like, yeah, but you know, the information is very good. So uh, check that out. Uh, and also uh, there's a PDF download here that explains the string meter, which we're going to go into right now. Our flashes do not matter, do not care, are not affiliated with shutter speed. I want everybody to understand that. The flash has nothing to do with shutter speed. It has nothing to do with ISO. It has to do with the power of the light coming out of the front. This little flash unit, and I love these little guys. This is a newer TT560. This little baby on Amazon cut, sets you back a whopping $39, free shipping, and they work like workhorses. Alpha lights. Um, I like them because they're totally manual. I'll put it right up there so you can see they're totally manual. There are no, um, no TTL. I don't do any of the TTL stuff. That's, it's something you can learn from someone who does TTL. <laughs> Not me. I don't use it. Um, totally manual flash. It's really great. You have, hey, yeah. We're still looking at the um, Sunny 16. Oh, so sorry. It's all right. I know you. Okay, so here. Are you looking at me now? I don't want to share. Not yet. Now you're seeing me? Here we go, yes. There you are. All right, thank you. This, this little guy, I'll, I'll put my, 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 my ad back in for these little Neewers. $39 shipping, prime, prime uh, Amazon shipping. These are great. The um, doesn't do it. Doesn't the uh, speed light that uh, Canon sells is like I think it's seven hundred dollars. It's still a light. It has a lot of gizmos and whirly things and lots of buttons and menus and stuff. But I don't use any of that stuff when I light. I do this manual lights. It's because what it's what I know. It's how I work. You are free to do whatever you want to do. I'll show you the back of this thing. Let me turn it on. And I'm going to push the, uh, the button here. And you're going to see the little blue light kind of move up to the tallest one, which is right there. That's full power. So if I flash it at full power, watch the red light. Full power, it's gonna be a lot of flash. And it takes a while for that red light to come back on. If I move it down to the bottom and I push the test, it's a tiny little bit of light and the red light stays on. Each one of these bars re represents going up, it's, a, it's doubling. So this is twice as much power twice as much power as that one, twice as much power as that one, twice as much power as that one. We go up and it's twice as much power. What does that correlate with when we're talking about our reciprocals? It correlates with the f-stops being twice as big or half as big and the shutter speeds being twice as fast, half as fast. Everything correlates. So if we make a change in our shutter speed and our aperture, we may have to make a change in our strobe. The reason is we changed the aperture, which is the amount of light coming in, not the duration. These are measured in amounts of light, power of light. Once you know the power of the light at any given setting here, you're essentially done you now know what this flash is going to give you. If you've got it set where it gives you an F4 amount of light, regardless of shutter speed, it's nothing to do with it, just the flash. F4 amount of light at 
three feet, it's always going to be F4 at three feet. It's never going to change until you change the power. And if it's F4 at three feet and you double the power, move it up one bar or whatever you do, you double the power, it's going to be a 5.6 because it's going to give you brighter light. So the, sh the hole is going to have to shut down to accommodate the brighter light. And if you do it again, it's going to give you F8. So you're going to have to shut the hole down again because you've got now F8 power coming through this thing. You've doubled the power. We've got to make the hole smaller. The only time shutter speed enters into it is you've got to be within flash sync. Now, some of you guys are sporting the new mirrorless cameras. I don't have a mirrorless camera, but I understand uh, that some of the mirror mirrorless cameras have outrageous shutter speeds. Anybody here sporting a mirrorless with a one thousandth of a second uh, sync speed? All right, um, you can you can do that, but these things it doesn't matter. You've got to be lower than your sync speed lower that. So how do we find out what these things are worth power-wise? Well, I do the string method. And we're just going to sort of, I can't do it in this room with this camera. I have a video. It's linked under resources. So go over there and check that out. You'll see me building a string meter in front of Hiram's garage. <laughs> What's the best place in the world to build string meter? Anyway, um, what we do is we start with the light on one eighth power, one eighth power. So full power, cut in half to half power, cut in half to quarter power, cut in half to eighth power. The reason we start at one eighth power is we're going to go in the middle of the flash range, in the middle, so that we can go up and we can go down. If we start at full power, we're going to have a string that's 18 feet long very difficult to manipulate, and we can only go one way. If we start with F, if we start with the, the least amount of power, we'll have a little bitty tiny string. It's not going to work. For most of us, one eighth power is perfect. So you pull the string out. First, you put a little loop in the string, and you put that on the top of your stand, wherever your stand is with your flash, you put it on top of your stand, and you pull the string out, and I'd say start at about 10 feet. Just pull the string out till you have the end. Straight out from the flash. So you're pulling it straight out from the flash. Take your light meter. Put it at the end of the string and fire the flash. You're looking for F4. We're not looking for 10 feet or eight feet. We're looking for F4. So if you're, if you're getting F2.8, you've got to come closer to the strobe. And if you're looking for, if you, if you pushed it and it said 5.6, you've got to move back on, this, on the string, on the rope or whatever. By the way, if, uh, if, if those of you, if you need me to make these for you, we have a, a custom pack of these uh, rope meters for $39.95. Uh, it's got my custom brand. I actually autograph it. No, I'm not doing that. Um, however, I have received emails from people wanting to know if they could buy a string meter. <laughs> I say yes, at Safeway. Um, so once you get F4, that's at this end. This is now F4. We now have an entire meter. All we have to use is the inverse square law. The inverse square law, which is always scary because it's got, you know, inverse. Nobody knows what inverse means. And then it's squared. Oh, yeah, remember that from high school? And then it's a law. Wow. Anyway, anyway the inverse square law gives us a light meter because we're now going to cut everything in half and in half again. We pull the string out till we get to the middle. We put a little knot in it. The inverse square law says that the light diminishes two stops every time it doubles the distance away. And that's because just like an 8 by 10,
if this is a four by five and we want to put four by fives into eight by tens, we can put four of them in there. Four, or sorry, five, four. Then we got another four by five, another four by five, another four by five. Four and four is eight. So it's four times, it's squared. Hope that makes sense. Um, so then we have that note here in the middle. We've cut that in the middle. We go back to our loop here. And we put a, a one in the middle there because we're going to cut that distance in half. We have to cut it in half because everything in photography is cut in half. So we're going to put a little loop there. And now we're going to put a loop between, we're going to put a knot between this knot, the one we just made, there's the other knot, the one in the middle of the rope here, and the loop at the end, the little knot. And we have one more knot to make. That's between this one that we first started with in the middle of the rope and the end. We're going to cut that one in half. Now, the cool thing about the rope meter, other than the fact that it never needs batteries, um, the cool thing about the rope meter is if you don't understand the, 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 the concept of the inverse square law, you can now feel it and touch it. That's your inverse square law right there. Pretty cool, huh? So if you pull this thing out from the meter, that's going to be F16. That's going to be F11. That's going to be F8. That's going to be F56. And that's going to be 4. You're going to have it right there at your fingertips. So if you put your flash on a stand, you put your rope meter out, and you put it on one eighth power. If you go, if you have this, uh, the thing as far away as here, it's F four. If you move it into this knot, it's five six. If you move it into this knot, it's eight and eleven and sixteen. Done. Understanding your reciprocals helps you change those numbers. So that's at ISO 100, that's what we started with. So now if you go to 200, this is no longer 16. We've made the light, the sensor, twice as powerful, so the light serves as twice as powerful, the sensor is twice as powerful. The 16 now is 22, 16, 11, 8, 5.6. How accurate is it? Absolutely perfectly accurate. You'll nail it with the rope meter. I didn't invent the rope meter. I didn't even invent the wheel, even though I'm probably old enough to. Um, this is what I saw when I shot film. Uh, when, they were, when they were making movies, they had these little chains that came out from the lights. And they'd bring out their light meters and they'd do all this stuff, but then the, the lighting director would pull his chain. And it didn't matter what the light meter said. If the chain was off, they moved the light. End of story. The chain never lies. It never gets fooled by a reflection. It never gets, the battery never gets low, et cetera, et cetera. These are great. Now, how does this help us? Well, in the studio, it's real simple. If you're going to put the flash on this stand as your main light, pull the string out to the person and shoot it. I hope you test this. I hope you, 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 you see that it does work. Absolutely. Just pull it out and test it. No, not hard. 
you're going to, you're going to find you nail it every time. Just use the string. Just got to remember the ISO is going to change everything as you go up and also the power. This flash unit, this one, does not have a zooming uh, lens up front. At least I, I do not think it does. I see no indication that it does. So, nope. This one does not have a zooming thing out front. Many of yours do. If you have, especially if you have like the Canons or the Speedlight or the uh, Nikons or some of the other the major brands, you, these things will zoom as well. Here's an interesting thing. If you zoom it all the way out so it's 200 millimeters or 135 millimeters, you're going to gain one stop. If you zoom it all the way back so it's wide angle, the, the, the wide angle thing, you're going to lose one stop. So where do you start with your flash when you're doing this test? You start with it at the 50, the normal thing, because if you zoom it out, you're going to get a zoomed uh, higher, higher ratio or higher amount of power because it concentrates the power. Trying to be a... Uh, <laughs> uh, this whole, um, Rob, this Rob asked if it was going to be downloaded. Uh, Rob, everything is going to be able to be downloaded. Um, this is being uh, ported. So, um, yeah, this is being uh, just, that was kind of scary. Uh, this is being recorded, so it'll be up on my YouTube channel uh, with a link from the page to that. In fact, I'll probably embed them right in the page. So, in the studio, it really makes sense. But, Don, what about an umbrella? Because I don't know about you guys, but I rarely shoot anybody with this naked, unless it's the look that I want. You know, they have these little things that pull out and say, well, that'll soften the light. No, it doesn't. Oh, it just makes the little transition edge a tiny bit softer. The shadow's just as dark and the highlight's just as bright. The thing about soft light is, it's in the transitions that makes light soft. But this little guy does have this little thing that pulls up, which is kind of cool. I never use it, but this, if you're out popping stuff, this is pretty cool. Um, the, and if you read the, uh, the lighting course that I have there, soft light has to do with the size of the light source versus the size of the subject. So this is forever going to be a three inch by one and a half inch light source. And it's never gonna be soft unless you put something in front of it, like a scrim or an umbrella, something to make the light source bigger. So what about those things? Easy. Almost every modifier I have ever stuck on one of these kills the light by two stops. So on your string meter, you've got your, your shoot through umbrella. Where do we measure from, by the way? Do we measure from the edge of the umbrella? No, we measure from the light source. When it's shooting through something, we measure from the light source. The distance of the umbrella from the light source makes no discernible difference until we start getting into distances that we don't use in photography. Okay. I mean, start, we start getting reciprocity fall off between the light and the umbrella. Yeah. But we're talking about normal situations. Okay. Normal situations, softbox, scrim, shoot through umbrella. We start with the light source. So it stays right on that same stand. You pull it out two stops. This is no longer 22. It went from 22 to 16 to 11. This is 11, 8, 5.6, 4. Oops, wait a minute. I did that wrong. Uh, 22, 22, 16, 8, 11. Yeah, sorry. It's 16, 
22 down to 16, to 11, to 8, no. 16. Uh, my brain is a little fried here. Did I tie this right? 11, 8, 5, 6, 4, 2, 8. Two stops. It kills two stops. We'll figure out what I did in my brain here. Uh, if you're shooting a bounce umbrella, the bounce is the source. So the loop goes to the inside of the bounce umbrella, not the light. If you're using a bounce umbrella, the light is hitting the umbrella. The bounce umbrella is now the source. So you go from the inside of the bounce umbrella. Two stops. Just about everything I tried. Everything. I've used translum, the, the moderate translum, uh, shower curtains, um, shoot through boxes, everything. Two stops. So you just figure it out with your reciprocity and you go from there. It works. And if it's a slightly off, believe me, you are so close that you're going to be moving the light distances like this instead of like this. I use a light meter, but I carry uh, rope meters for each one of my um, strobes, my little, my little guys tucked in their little carry bags here, each one, because quite honestly, it's, it's really, really fast. How are we doing on time? Okay. Got to get into ambient natural light situations where you want to use flash. This is where it gets, it sounds complicated, but once you understand the process, it's not at all complicated. We already know how much light this guy's going to put out at one eighth power. We know it's going to put out this much light. And it measured at uh, my string here. On my string, that's going to be F4, 5, 6. That's going to be F8 right here at this knot, F8. If I'm that far away from my subject with my flash, always. So I go out into the field and I'm shooting somebody, a model or a portrait of someone, and I have them sitting maybe a little bit backlit, late afternoon sun. I don't worry about my flash first. I worry about my shutter speed being within the sync ratio, has to be within sync. And then I, I make the shot and I get the shot without the flash to look good. The rest of it, the background, does the, does, does the lake and the trees look nice? Okay, I am happy with the lake and the trees and all of that, now my subject's a little bit dark. What do I have? I have F8 at 125th of a second. I've already got my exposure. That's my exposure. All I have to do is move this light to that knot right there, and that's F8. Done. Just done. That's it. There's nothing else you have to do. You have to put the light where you want it, you know, so you're not getting like shadows and all that kind of crap. You have to do that, but just pull it out to that knot and you've got it. When I hear people say it's so hard to do it outside, no, it's not. Not, not when you divorce your thinking from shutter speed having anything to do with this. This has only to do with the aperture. So, if you're in a shady situation, you're down in F4, and you want to add a little wink of light, put this on 1 8th power, pull the strobe out to the end of the, the meter, one rope meter, and you've got F4. You're going to match the ambient light that's in there. What if you had an umbrella here? Shoot through umbrella. Put the shoot through umbrella in kills two stops, add the two stops by hitting plus once, twice, now you're at half power, you're gonna be at F4. I hope that makes sense. Does that make anybody confused? I'm looking at the names up here, I'm going, God, I hope these guys aren't confused. <laughs> Steve Goldstein, if you're confused, I'm coming over there, buddy. <laughs> so. Um, uh, anybody else, anybody confused? Anybody need a, a 
Did we go over this again? Because it's it's quite simple. I'll take questions over in the um, uh, in the little chat window if you have a question, or you can just open your microphone out and shout out the question. It's very very cool. Anybody else shooting with these little cheapy guys, these little newers? These are so good. I can't believe how good these are. I got one of these I bought two years ago. Uh, and I think I've, I mean, I've, I've, I've carried it all over the, the you know, Canada and, and the USA and my motorcycle and uh, shot everything on the planet with it. And I mean, just flashes all the time. Can't beat it. Thirty nine ninety five free shipping. <clears throat> All right. Well, if there are uh, no, did, did, was this helpful? Did I screw anybody's brain up? Let me find out from some folks. Stephen, was that? Did you agree with everything I said? Because you've taken my workshop, right? Hit your little um, micro microphone button there, Stephen. There it is. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah, I have a really horrible mic on this end, but uh, no, it wasn't confusing. And yeah, I took your course a while ago. So you got a string meter. Yeah, yeah, it's it's packed away, but yeah, and um, I haven't used it as much as I probably should because I'm kind of I'm when I shoot, I'm generally on the go. Um, like I go to events like Comic Con and whatnot, and I'm shooting with the flash on the on you, the camera you're shooting ettl on that actually no i go manual oh do you really yeah that's so, the only place i would use ettl in a situation like that i i'm generally having to overpower or overcome i should say the horrible lighting in the convention center and whatnot so i've got to monkey around with stuff um but yeah no i've i've used the the rope beater um when i had group shots mm -hmm. so that's been really helpful well, the cool, and the cool thing, and Stephen, you'll back me up on this, because uh, Stephen took my, my workshop a long time ago. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a rope that's a little bit longer than the width of uh, the span of your arms, right? Mm -hmm. How long is it going to get before you guys kind of know where to put it? Right. Trust me, not very long. All of a sudden, you're like, you know where that F8 is. You can just, you can eyeball F8, or at least close enough to F8 that you may only have to make one shot, move it in a little bit move it out a little bit. That's it. You're going to eyeball it. We are creatures of habit. You do this, you use the string meter for, you know, a dozen shoots. You're going to start knowing where to put it. You're going to start instinctively knowing, well, I got to put it here. I got a, I got an umbrella. I got to pop it up to two stops. The whole bit is just really, really fascinating. I, you know, this, this is uh, Bob. Bob's been with me for 32 years. This is, 32 years old. I still use it, but I don't use it as much as I used to because even in the studio, when the flash goes off, I can give you a pretty good, I'm, I'll, I'll be within a half stop because I've done it for so many years. Now, I, if I get into, if we're out at a bar and it's low light and stuff, no, I'm sorry. I, I can't gauge that because our eyes change. But if I'm outside in daylight or if I'm uh, in the studio using soft boxes or umbrellas, I can pretty much tell you within a stop, within a half stop actually, um, what it is. So I want to bet doing that once in Singapore, they brought out this great big brown color parabolic, this thing that had four heads, four brown color heads on it. The guy has it across the room and he flashes and he goes, so how much, how, what was that? And I said, that was 7.1. He runs over with his meter, hits it. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> I know this stuff because I've done it for so long. Not because I'm a genius. Trust me on that. Any other questions? Oh, I got one over here. Okay, good. Uh, Want to do something tethered? That would be great. Rob, you're going to watch it a second time. That's fine. That's fine. You have any questions? Just if you're if you're on Facebook, tag me and I'll I'll answer the question. If you're not, send me an email. Uh, whatever, we'll get you we'll get you worked out through it. So, hey Don, this is Stephen again. Yes, yeah, Stephen. Just, 
I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you. I mean, it was 10 years ago that I took that, that uh, workshop. And there were things that I learned in that, in that workshop that I had never heard before, never knew before that have stuck with me the whole time. And I have asked you questions over the, over the years and you have answered them. It's just, it's wonderful. Like you're the, the level of mentorship that I've gotten from you has just been uh, unbelievable. unbelievable. Thanks, so thank you so much. Thank, well, thank you for that. those kind words. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, for everybody else, I, um, Sandra's here. Hi, Sandra. Oh, we got a lot of people. Ivan's here. So Ivan, Ivan, I, I, I know Ivan pretty well. Ivan, are you there? So, so are, are you all confused now, Ivan? He's, he's, he's so confused right now about my inverse square law rope meter. He can't even find his, his microphone. Look at that, my glasses are crooked. No wonder. No, actually, I do use the rope meter. What's that, Ivan? I do use the rope meter. Yeah, it works. It's, it's, you set up in your studio and you, you run the rope out from the, from, the, uh, from the stand, like you say, and bada bing, bada boom. It, it's, you know, all, you, all you're concerned then really is with the angles and those types of things, but you're not fighting. You're just not fighting the, you know, exposures and all that stuff. And folks, it works. You put a, uh, it works on pro photos too. I have a friend, I have a good friend, uh, David, um, uh, does a lot of architectures and architecture and spas. And what David does when he gets a new light, he puts it in the studio takes a tape measure and measures the light at 10 feet, full power at 10 feet. What is it at 10 feet? He writes that down in his little notebook and he's done. That's it. He just needs to know what it is at 10 feet because he can then figure out what it is at 20 and what it is at five and what it is at 30 by using inverse square law. And it's when you're out shooting a spa, you know, you're shining a light up on that, that balcony if you can't get up on the balcony, how are you going to meter it? You better know what that is. So he takes his little Home Depot thing out, says, oh, 14 feet away, makes a setting on his, uh, uh, used to use Pro Photos, he uses Einstein's now, makes a setting on his Einstein. Boom. Does that, does that mean it's perfect? Every first shot's perfect? No, of course not. It means that he's so close he can just go in, and tweak it instead of shooting and shooting and shooting to try to find that. I heard a photographer, someone I think should know better, um, by the way, uh, his answer, where do you start when you're shooting? His answer is, well, just pick, a, pick an f-stop. You have to start somewhere. No, understand the, the sunny 16 rule, and you know exactly where to start if you're outside. If you're not outside, I would say do a couple of quick tests. One of the things I love about digital photography is it allows me to go and 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 shoot things as a test, kind of sketching, like sketching with my camera. You know, like I'll, I'll check that out, I'll check that out. I'll take the strobe, I'll pull my, my rope meter out, or I'll say, well, that's pretty far back there. I'm going to go with F2 or F2.8. I'll set it right here, maybe bump the power, take another shot. It's never going to be blown out. It's never going to be dark. It may not be perfect, but it's going to be pretty close because I understand what I'm doing with it. And then you can make some great decisions then come back and light the set. Do it, you know, perfectly. But I love that we can do that. We, we used to sort of do that with Polaroids. But, you know, I, I, I had a Polaroid back for my Nikon, and I'd put it on and make the shot, which was great. I'd get this little Polaroid back, and it'd be this big, you know, so same size as a 35-millimeter frame down in the corner of my Polaroid. Yeah, it would tell me something, but it was also, you know, so small. It's crazy. And it's different if you're going to pull out your 4x5 to do a Polaroid and then shoot it on your 35. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be a little bit different. That type of, you know, I hated doing that as well. But we would shoot a box of Polaroids sketching out where what we're going to do. And now we can just do it quickly and see it on the laptop or the iPad or wherever you're, you're shooting to. Um, and I just love that. It's a really, really uh, great, uh, great resource for us. So uh, once again, over on the um, 
on my website is the, uh, the place where we signed up here is the resources. It's got the string leader thing. Um, Rob, it's got the string leader. Download that uh, PDF. It'll kind of walk you through it. If you have any troubles, uh, let me know and we will uh, we'll get you handled. And that goes for everybody. If you have a little bit of trouble, let me know. So uh, if there's no other questions, I'll give you like 30 seconds. If no other questions, I'm going to go and uh, get my cake out of the freezer and get ready for the chocolate shot. Um, I bought the most ridiculous chocolate cake. <laughs> That's my wife thinks I bought it because I like chocolate cake and then we'll be able to eat it. I, I, that was not my intention, but it will be my action. Everybody, thanks for coming along. Enjoy your cake. And thank you so much for this uh, class. It was very helpful. Very good. I'm glad you were here. Don. All right. Thank you. Care. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, Don.